Hi, this is Dr. Crane. I'm going to give you a very simplistic approach to kidney disease, which I think organizes the material in a way that makes it understandable. So I like to divide kidney disease between those that are tubular interstitial diseases, and those are recognized by the fact that your analysis is relatively benign, though there sometimes is some hematuria or just a small amount of proteinuria. And that really has to be distinguished from those diseases that are glomerular. And the glomerular diseases are recognized by the presence of proteinuria and hematuria. The nephrotic disorders have proteinuria more than 3.5 grams with edema, low albumin, and hypercholesterolemia, and are usually diseases of the podocyte, where nephritic syndrome has hematuria and proteinuria, and progressive renal failure more often with salt and water retention. And the classic feature of nephritic syndrome is the RBC cast shown here, though in clinical practice, it's surprisingly uncommon, but if you see it on an exam, it's a case of nephritic syndrome. So let's turn to nephrotic syndrome. So in nephrotic syndrome, I like to divide these diseases between those that are primary, meaning this is how they present with only kidney disease, meaning edema, hypertension, or reduced GFR. And these primary diseases all require kidney biopsy to make the diagnosis. The first one being minimal change disease, which is primarily a disease of children, though it does occur in adults and presents with the sudden onset of severe nephrotic syndrome. And on kidney biopsy, normal and immunofluorescence will be normal, and the only feature is the fusion of the foot processes, which are shown here on electron microscopy. Another really important disease is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, the most common cause of idiopathic nephrotic syndrome in African Americans. And this presents more often with progressive renal failure and hypertension, and you can see the segmental scar. It's also a disease associated with HIV and other diseases. And finally, there's membranous glomerulopathy, more common in adults, presents with slowly progressive proteinuria and renal dysfunction, though sometimes this can remit. And it, on silver stain, you can see these little spikes, which are the electron de dense deposits. Immunofluorescence is a granular deposit of the deposits. And you can also see on electron microscopy, as shown here, the capillary loop with the sub-epithelial electron dense deposits. The idiopathic cases are associated with antiphospholipid A2 receptor antibodies. Other causes include underlying cancer. Now, if we turn to systemic diseases associated with nephrotic syndrome, the most important cause of nephrotic syndrome that we all see is diabetes, which can be either preclinical with microalbuminuria, important to identify because we treat people with ACE inhibitors, or overt nephrotic syndrome, which progresses to renal failure. Second disease, much less common, would be amyloidosis, which can be idiopathic or associated with multiple myeloma, and you can see the fibrils on the electron microscope. And finally, lupus can present with nephrotic syndrome. So let's turn to nephritic syndrome, which is an inflammatory process, and therefore complement activation is a very important process in many of these patients, and we divide them between those that have low serum complement, in which case the patients can either have a primary disease or a systemic disease. The primary disease, classically, that we talk about is post-infectious glomerulonephritis, otherwise seen as post strep glomerulonephritis, where there's a latent period of 7 to 10 days after the infection with low serum complement. It's an immune complex mediated disease, and you can see here on the electron microscope that it's associated with these large subepithelial humps that are shown by the arrow. MPG to N is another important cause that's associated with hepatitis C, and then the systemic causes include lupus which is the most common cause of nephritic syndrome we see. Now let's turn to normal serum complement. Normal serum complements would do the same thing. They're either primary diseases or systemic diseases of the kidney. And the primary diseases, again, present only with symptoms of kidney disease, primarily worsening renal function and hypertension. And the first disease is ANCA-positive glomerulonephritis, which is really a form of microscopic polyangiitis. And the characteristic feature of this disease is a large subepithelial crescent with negative immunofluorescence. And when that's seen, it represents a very aggressive form of glomerulonephritis. But it can be seen with other diseases, including lupus or diseases with anti-GBM antibodies, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now, another important disease is IgA nephropathy, which is an idiopathic disorder associated classically with intermittent gross hematuria 
diagnosed only by kidney biopsy, demonstrating mesangial deposition of IgA shown here. And finally, there's Alport syndrome, which is a disease that is hereditary associated with hearing loss as sometimes uh, visual changes, more often excellent due to changes in collagen 4. Now, the systemic diseases include good pasture syndrome, a classic disease associated with hemoptysis, anti-GBM antibodies, and pulmonary hemorrhage, as well as kidney failure. And the classic diagnosis is made by kidney biopsy, shown here with the anti-GBM antibody staining in a linear fashion along the glomerular basement membrane. It's a rare disease, and it is seen more often on exams than in real life. Other important causes include uh, both the variety of systemic vasculitides as well as TTP and HUS. So I hope this uh, whirlwind tour of the kidney has given you a good